and welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Are your knees wearing out? Does it hurt when you walk, especially when you're walking downhill or walking on a hard surface? Are you beginning to limp? Do people notice that? Are you worried about having knee replacement or knee surgery? We'll be spending most of this show answering those questions. My guest is Dr. Joe Chinger. Dr. Chinger is a board certified orthopedic surgeon who deals with this problem every day. He'll be talking to us about how to prevent knee surgery and newer types of knee replacement. Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Overholt, and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes on the Dr. Bob Show. Later on, we'll be talking about heart palpitations. Are they dangerous? Could be. And lifestyle changes that will cool down the heartburn of reflux disease. A lot of information for you. You'll want to stay tuned. We're talking with Dr. Joe Chinger, board certified orthopedic surgeon, and we're going to be talking about knee arthritis and knee replacement. Joe, welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Thanks for having me back, Dr. Bob. What's the most common cause of knee replacement or knee arthritis? What ha what's going on? Well, let me, let me kind of back up a bit. I think there's uh, arthritis of the knee happens for three big reasons. The number one big reason, especially in today with all the baby boomers, is, is trauma. So uh, sports-related injury, football, basketball, tennis, you tear your meniscus, that little shock absorber type gliding mechanism in the knee, and then you go in and you have to have it removed partially or completely. That sets the stage up for arthritis. So trauma from an arthroscopic meniscectomy or an injury sets the stage for arthritis. That's probably the the biggest reason for us to, to see arthritis of the knee. How about runners on a hard road? De definitely, the, and the runners on a hard road will typically damage their menisci, so we'll, we'll see that pretty frequently. You know, some people are genetically designed to sure. run, and there's some people that aren't. The people that aren't designed to run are the ones that tear their menisci and lead to, to arthritis. You know, we'll see people that run into their 70s and 80s pretty comfortably. But you know, eventually the, the running, the, the repetitive jarring will lead to arthritis. So that's the number one cause. Number two is genetics. You know, if, if you could pick your families a little bit better, we could probably escape <laughs> it. But you know, a, a mom or a dad or gra grandmother or grandfather that has an arthritic knee that ends up with a knee replacement, is if, if you see that in your family history, unfortunately you may be heading for it. Yeah. Th third thing? Third thing is this uh, group called rheumatologic uh, uh, Autoimmune disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, Reiter syndrome, SLE. That's kind of the third reason these anti-inflammatory autoimmune disorders that cause arthritis, but it affects everything. It affects your knees, your hips, your hands, your feet. And I'm sure you're pretty familiar with those diseases, I'm sure. Absolutely. So that's kind of the third category that we see. What symptoms do they give you in the knee? How does it start? How does it progress? And right. How do people hurt? Yeah, you know, typically two ways. The, the, the typical way is a slow, kind of insidious, progressive type of problem. Their knee aches, that hurts. It starts cracking, popping, it starts swelling, uh, becomes sore and stiff. So patients will, or will present with uh, startup type pain. You know, after they've been sitting for, in a chair, they get up and they can't stand and walk more fluidly. It takes some time to get up. In the morning after they get out of bed, it takes 20 or 30 minutes to get going. Or after they've been up walking, they go for a walk in the park, walk around the mall, and their knee starts to hurt. It becomes painful, swollen, stiff. They have trouble getting up from a sitting to a standing position. It takes a few minutes to get going after they've been sitting. So that's kind of When somebody how has those symptoms, and you know it's because something's going on to the knees, do you go to physical exam? Do you go to x-rays? Do you take the history? How do you decide? how to handle that patient. What can they do to prevent from having surgery? Right. But when they need it, what do you see? Right. History is, is extremely important, just kind of the history of what brings it on. 
Now, if, if I get a history uh, that the patient's knee clicks, pops, hangs up, locks, that makes me think that there's something mechanical inside the knee that may be an issue, a meniscus that's torn, maybe something loose floating around inside there. So that's really important history. You know, the examination is very, very important. So again, if, if I examine someone and they stand and their knees are a little deformed, bow-legged, knocked knee, uh, as they walk, you can see their knee kind of shift over to the side. I call that a lateral thrust. Those are signs that there's more progressive arthritis. And then when you examine the patient's knee, you may feel the knee click pop. You may feel some grinding. You, you may actually even get the sensation that bone rubs against bone. It's kind of an actual grinding kind of sensation that you get. That, that's a sensation you see with more advanced arthritis. What does the x-ray look at that time with more advanced versus not so bad? Let's see what we can do to prevent. Yeah, so in the, in the beginning stages, the x-ray may actually look normal. Uh, and those are the patients that may have a torn meniscus or something inside the knee that's damaged. And then as the arthritis progresses, the little the clear joint space uh -huh. starts to become narrower and narrower. Bad sign. Bad sign. You start developing what we call bone spurs. The body actually creates a, a bony kind of projection around the joint. To, and that's probably designed to stabilize the joint. And then you may see some actual bone cysts develop under the surface of the bone. As you see this bone spurs and the bone cysts, that's a sign of much more advanced arthritis. And what can you do to prevent that progression? Is there anything you can do? If somebody comes in, knee hurts. Right. Uh, it doesn't look like you need <clears throat> surgery right now. Let's try this and this. What do yeah. you try? Well, unfortunately, you know, for most arthritis conditions, there's not anything preventative that you can do to reverse the disease. So we're really kind of limited to um, methods of managing or, uh, or trying to moderate or temporize the symptoms. Now, if you have someone has a meniscus tear, a men torn meniscus in the knee joint creates mechanical damage and that can accelerate the arthritis. Those are patients that on knee arthroscopy, going in with this arthroscopic procedure uh -huh. with a small scope, we can trim out that torn meniscus and take away the mechanical damaging component to it and hopefully delay the, the progression of the arthritis. Most other, the genetic forms of arthritis or the rheumatologic forms, the best that we can really do is manage the symptoms. So, but we can do a very good job in patients that, that hurt by physical therapy, improving their range of motion and strength. Medications, the conventional, we call them NSAIDs, the, you know, the Aleve and Advil and some of the more elaborate, uh, these COX-2 inhibitors, Celebrex, controlling the inflammation. Um, and then there's these other group of treatment modalities, the injection. So cortisone, which is kind of our go-to uh, way of keeping arthritis under control. Patient comes in, their knee is inflamed, we can use a uh, corticosteroid, a steroid injection directly into the knee joint that will pretty rapidly get the inflammation and the pain to settle down. Unfortunately, it's not a permanent solution. Sometimes last six weeks, maybe three months or, or six months. And then, then the final thing are these, we call them visco supplementation, the Supart Synvis, these gel injections. A lot of them are made from the comb of a rooster. That's do they a, work? They, they do, they do. They're a little unpredictable, but they can definitely get sometimes six months to a year's worth of relief in patients. So, so you can get some good time, mm -hmm. but eventually you're going to have to have knee replacement. Is that effective? It's extremely effective. It's uh, probably and one of the best things we can do. And that's what we're gonna be talking about when we come back. We all know about knee replacement. What's the best knee replacement? Are there options? What can we do with that? What's the recovery time? Uh, a lot of information. You'll wanna stay tuned. We're talking with Dr. Joe Chinger, board certified orthopedic surgeon, and we're talking about knee arthritis and the need for replacement. The symptoms are pain, swelling. You can hear noises as you walk. You can feel popping, and those are signs of danger. X-rays will show the need for knee replacement. Joe, if somebody needs knee replacement, what are the options you tell people? Yeah. Um, so we've already decided the patients, we call it failed conservative treatment. We tried all those things you've talked about, nothing's working. So at this point, the patient is really a candidate for a knee replacement based on the things we've talked about. 
So if, if this is this is a model of a normal knee, when we do a knee replacement, literally all now of this is the this is the patella. That's the kneecap. The kneecap. Uh -huh. And this is the tendon called the patellar tendon. Yes. And this is the bone called the femur. That's the top bone. The top of the bone, the thigh bone. Uh huh. And then the bottom bone is the shin or the tibia. Okay. So the surfaces that are replaced are all of those surfaces that glide together uh, normally. So the patella, the surface of the patella is replaced. The femur is replaced with a metal cap. The top of the tibia is replaced with a plate and then a plastic bearing surface. So you have to replace all of those? All that's replaced, yes sir. What are the options of doing that? So uh, the, the conventional way that uh, surgeons are trained is through just a standard approach where the, the incision comes in the middle of the knee uh, and the, the patellar tendon and patellar are actually dislocated off the femur. So they pull it out of the right, way? To get exposure and you can see that to do that as this kneecap is, uh, the patella is dislocated, you get very good view. Yeah. I mean, in fact, you could drive a Mack truck in there if you do about that. So the surgery is done that way. The other approach, which is what I've been doing for probably close to 10 years, is an approach where the incision is more medial. Instead of cutting the patellar tendon, the incision comes up. It comes across this muscle called the vastus medialis, which is called a quadriceps muscle. Mm -hmm. We spare it, and instead of dislocating the kneecap, it's slid over to the side. So this entire quadriceps mechanism is protected. Now, why is the quadriceps so important? It, the quad, is, the, is it a quadriceps sparing? Is that what you're talking about yeah, here? This is called a quad sparing total knee replacement. Uh -huh. The quads muscle is that muscle that gets you to straighten your leg up. So it, it does your straight leg raising. If you cut through the quads muscle, it has to heal before you can do that comfortably. That takes about six, eight weeks. If I, if I preserve that quads muscle, literally the day of the surgery, the patient's lifting their leg straight up in the air. So they can the day do, of surgery, they the can The day do of that. surgery, yes, sir. Okay, so you've got quadriceps sparing. Mm -hmm. you, what type of hardware, what type of knee yeah. replacement do you put in? Both the, the standard and your type the same? Now, it, in the quad sparing procedure, which is what I do, I put in the exact same implants. But to do that, we have some specialized instrumentation to kind of get things into that small space. And there are things that I've actually worked on, and most of them I've developed over the last probably 10 years myself, modifications of standard equipment. So this is what we put inside of the patient's knee. And uh, everyone seems to think we actually cut their legs off, but we really don't. So uh, on the shin part of it, we just actually remove just the surface of the shin bone, enough to put this metal plate on the top surface. Ah. Okay. On the femur, we don't, again, we don't cut your femur off. You can see how it's squared off? Yes. And then this femoral component is put onto the end of the femur to resurface it. And then this is the, the little plastic liner which replaces the actual joint. So this particular device, this is a new, new, new knee replacement I've been using for probably the last six months. And it's called a rotating platform. And if, I don't know if you can kind of appreciate that. As the knee bends and the tibia moves, this plastic piece. So normally it doesn't move laterally. Right. Why does that help? So what I found with this particular device is the knee, all knee replacements are going to make some noise. Uh -huh. This particular knee, as it flexes and rotates, gives a much more fluid feel. So the patients don't perceive as much of that noise, the clicking and popping, and it just it feels more normal. And I have to admit, I was a bit bit skeptical. But after I've used it, the patients really, really, it, they love it. I mean, it performs even better it, than what we've done. What's it called? This is made by a company called Atu uh, a company Atune. called Depew. It's called an Atune knee, and it's called a rotating platform knee. And it's, it's marketed for maybe a higher performance type of patient. Someone does sports, uh, tennis, pivoting, twist, twisting kind of activities where that rotation happens more normally. So after a knee replacement, you can... Do what type of physical activity? Doubles tennis or regular tennis? So the patients today are very high performance uh, driven individuals. Certainly doubles tennis is, is, is absolutely acceptable. Riding a bike, hiking, walking, playing golf. Uh, I've had patients actually rock climbing. Wow. I mean, it, it's the high impact activities, jogging, um, you know, that, you soccer, want to stay away that from. we want to stay away from because those are things that can lead to early failure or loosening of a knee replacement. Let's go back to the surgery. Sure. What is the length of time in the, and you call it minimally invasive, Correct. quadriceps sparing. Correct. And is the quadriceps sparing the, the key issue? That, that is the key issue. The, the length of the incision is going to be smaller with these particular uh -huh. procedures, 
but it, the length of the incision is not as critical as it is what we do to the soft tissues. Preserving the quadriceps muscle leads to an easier, less painful recovery, so the patients do recover faster. So instead of six to eight weeks for quadriceps, if you cut it, it's less time. Right. You're doing, so, we talked before the show, you're doing some other things to cut down on pain. So let's talk, with surgery, somebody's mm -hmm. having knee surgery, it's gotta hurt. What do you do to help yeah. the patient now that's new? Man, we, in the last two years, we've had two really big innovations that have helped us. The first thing is there's this medicine called transoxemic acid. It's a drug used originally in the cardiac surgery world, mm -hmm. and it was designed to minimize bleeding during these major open heart procedures. We found that if you use that for a knee replacement, transfusion rates go in our hospital from 18 to literally 2%. Uh, it's, it's even rare now that we have to transfuse a patient with a knee replacement. That's a, a really beneficial thing. If the patients don't lose that much blood, they're healthier, they get out of the hospital quicker, they don't have to build their blood back up, we don't have to give them a transfusion and expose them to all those. Heal faster? They heal faster. And what's the other new thing that you yeah. do? The other thing for, for pain management, we have a, what's called a joint cocktail injection. And it's a combination of medicine. One of the drugs is much like the dentist used. It's a medicine called Marcaine. It's a local anesthetic agent. And it's a long acting local anesthetic agent. And it's mixed with a combination of other medicines. One is a cortisone. One is another drug called ketamine, which is an anesthetic agent, and tortol, which is an anti-inflammatory. These patients literally will have no pain for 24, 48, sometimes longer than that. And so they, if they had surgery at uh, 2.30 today and you gave them the joint cocktail, could they walk that night? They, they, today, they, every single patient that we do in the morning gets up in the afternoon and walks the hall. So they walk the hall the first day. They walk the hall the first day. And these, it's, these patients have virtually no pain. When uh, they walk the hall, how long do they have to stay in the hospital then? The hospital stays are declining. You know, the, the, currently today, 24, 48 hours is a pretty standard length of stay. And that's not us kicking someone out of the hospital. These are patients that want to go home. I mean, they're anxious to get out of the hospital. So if they're operated on Wednesday, they go home on Friday or Saturday? Usually Friday. Physical therapy, uh, how long does it take before they totally recover? When can they get back yeah. to the work? When can they go to church? When can they yeah. do their functions? If I operate on someone on Monday, most of them can go to church on, on the weekend, on the, the, this coming weekend. They'll be on a cane within a week or 10 days, driving the car in two or three weeks. Most of them are back to pretty normal activities at four to six weeks. I'll see them back at six weeks. The vast majority of patients, I can actually discharge them and I don't have to see them back until a year. The standard knee where they have a longer surgery and they have to cut the quadriceps muscle, their recovery is? Probably twice that. Twice that. I would say. The results at the end of two years, if you're looking down the road, Exactly the same. They're actually the same, You're using the same hardware. Same hardware. It's just a different approach that they've got. Right. And it looks like the innovation of what I call the knee cocktail there has really, if you take pain away that first day and get them active, that's what we do now. In the old days, right. you'd stay in the hospital for 99 years, it seems it, like. It, it's, it's, you know, the, the patients, uh, the worst pain that they experience is the first one or two days. If you can get that behind them, they're gonna have pain, don't get me wrong but the bad pain is behind them. And now they can deal with it pretty easy with a, a, a pain pill or something pretty simple, so. How long does a knee replacement last? The, the new designs are gonna last 25 or 30 years with normal wear and tear. They're, they're really good. In fact, the reason for a knee replacement to fail is, is often not because something wears out or comes loose. It's usually because a, a fall causes something to break, an infection gets into the knee joint later on in life. So, I mean, these things will last for a very long period of time if you look after them. Joe Chinger, I love talking with you. I want to thank you for coming to the Dr. Bob Show. It's amazing what you can do with knee replacement, and I appreciate your coming and relating that information to us. Dr. Bob, thanks for letting me share that with you. Uh, it's great. Isn't that great information? Know that if you've got knee problems, knee replacement can give you pain-free life. Now you'll want to stay tuned. We are going to be talking about heart palpitations and how to cool down that heartburn with reflux disease. I want to thank Dr. Joe Chinger. Wonderful discussion on knee replacement. 
minimally invasive quadriceps sparing. And now for questions from you, the viewer, that I think will be important to your health. Question number one, Dr. Bob, my heart flutters and I have palpations. I'm afraid I'm going to have a heart attack. Heart palpations, palpitations, are a very, very common thing. People will feel their heart will just suddenly skip a beat or there will be a fluttering of beats. It's very, very frightening because they know something's going on with their heart. Now, frequently, if it's just an extra beat, it'll be a sensation as somebody is like they're suddenly scared, like somebody said boo, and that's just one extra beat that's happening. It gives those sensations not a problem unless it gets more frequent with exercise. Now, usually it's when we're sitting down. When we're sitting down, the heart's resting, the heart's beating slower. That's when we get the extra beat, the feeling as if somebody said boo and you get like that, that's not dangerous. You just need to tell your doctor about it. If you get runs like that, you're not gonna be able to catch it on an electrocardiogram, so you need to be able to tell your doctor. So if you can take your pulse in the wrist or in the neck, only one side at a time, you can help your doctor with your pulse. Normal pulse rate is about 70. If it's a lot higher than that, you need to talk to your doctor. There are several things that can cause problems with palpitation and fluttering of the heart. An overactive thyroid can cause that. Anxiety can cause that. Uh, worrying about your heart with anxiety can cause that. There are some other conditions that make your heart race for a longer period of time, like 30 minutes or two hours. There is a condition with medical word, we call it supraventricular tachycardia, medical words, SVT, very common. The heart rate suddenly jumps up to about 150 to 160 a minute. It goes boom, 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 boom. And you can feel your heart pounding and then bingo, all of a sudden it will stop. Your doctor may put on a monitor that he can help pick up that irregular rhythm called a Holter monitor. Another irregular rhythm is atrial fibrillation, where the heart beats irregular on an irregular basis. So it may go boom, 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 boom. And that type is very dangerous because there's an increased incidence of throwing blood clots out of the heart, and the first place it gets to is the brain. So 25% of strokes are because people have atrial fibrillation. If you have atrial fibrillation, your doctor will want to treat it. Sometimes it starts with very short intervals of an hour or two hours, then it builds up to six hours and then a day. Your doctor will tell you when you need to be on a blood thinner, or perhaps they can do, they can do ablation and they can stop the atrial fibrillation. Uh, question number two, Dr. Bob. I've got heartburn, my doctor told me I have reflux disease, what can I do about it? Well, there are simple things that we can do without medications. Number one, reflux is where acid comes back from the stomach up the esophagus. So we swallow food, it starts getting acid, it comes back up this way, you may belch a lot. If you're overweight, the pressure of being overweight pushes the food up the esophagus. Number one, we lose weight. When we lay down at nighttime, we lay down on our back. When we lay down on our back, gravity pushes that food back up. So we elevate the foot of the, uh, the head of the bed, elevate the head of the bed. So acid wants to go that way. Don't eat before you go to bed. So you can't eat for three hours before you go to bed because if there's food in the stomach, you lay down in bed, boop, it'll want to come up this way. When you lay down in bed, lay down on your left side that will keep reflux from occurring a little bit better. Don't smoke. When you smoke, it will relax the sphincter that's trying to keep the food in the stomach and it lets it come back easier. So if you've got reflux, know that you elevate the head of the bed, lose weight, uh, lie on your left side, don't eat spicy foods, quit smoking. Those are things you can do without the doctor. The doctor will then, if you have reflux, he'll put you on appropriate medications that will cut down on that burning sensation that you have in the stomach. It's usually a proton pump inhibitor. Those should be taken 
first thing in the morning, about an hour before you eat, because it gets in the system, and then you eat, the acid pumps come out, and the blocker blocks that. So 60 minutes before a meal is ideal. Talk with your doctor about the time of day you need to take it. Some people need to take it twice a day. Well, that's all the time that we have for this show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Remember those four things. Exercising, it'll help you lose weight, reduce stress, lower your blood pressure. Remember, seven and a half hours of sleep, maybe one of the most important things you can do after exercise. The, the sleep will make you feel better. The people around you will feel better. If you're not sleeping well, talk that over with your doctor. Eat a good breakfast. There's nothing like nutrition. We eat too much food in the United States, and we have a full stomach too much of the time. So start the day off with a breakfast of fruit and fiber. It's got antioxidants. The fiber in the breakfast will help lower your cholesterol. You'll feel full. You'll start the day off the way you should. And make every meal a little less more. Don't eat before you go to bed. Most of all, what do we like in the Dr. Bob Show? It's that laughter in your life. Laugh a lot, giggle a lot, and you will stay healthy. 